By the time Avatar The Last Airbender kicks off, the majority of those with the power to be human leaf blowers have long been since wiped out. That is, of course, besides the Avatar, but I'm sure you've seen the intro. He vanished. Although for most of the series, we learn about the Air Nomads through flashbacks, once the harmonic convergence happens in The Legend of Korra, that all changed. So here's 10 little known facts about the Air Nomads. One of the most striking things about Aang when we first see him are the blue tattoos that run along his body. Later in the series, we find out that those tattoos are only given to airbending masters, but that wasn't always the case. When it's Korra's time to step into the great balancer role, we get a flashback to the first avatar, Lon, and we see that originally, they had slightly different tattoos. Instead of the arrow, we see Aang and other air nomads of his era sport. The OG air nomads had markings of an upside down T with a dot underneath it. Those original tattoos weren't just for airbending either, as children were shown to have them. The tattoos were used as a of their faith, and it wasn't until they learned more advanced forms of airbending from the flying bison that the tattoos started looking like what we are so used to seeing today as a sort of thank you for their lessons. Even outside of the flying bison, the arrows are also meant to mark the path in which Chi moves throughout the body, which explains why Aang's tattoo lights up like a glow stick every time he enters the Avatar state. Being connected to all the previous avatars requires some spiritual skill, and Aang comes off as a very thoughtful and spiritually inclined person, but it's not just because of his avatar heritage. A lot of it comes from the teachings of the monks at the Southern Air Temple. Going back to the predecessors of the Air Nomads during Wan and Rava's era, they originally were able to gain airbending from the Air Lion Turtles through energy bending that allowed them to use airbending. It's important to know that the Lion Turtles used energy bending to allow humans to use bending of all four major elements, but what made the airbenders at the time special was that they coexisted with the spirits and would go into the spirit wilds to gather food and resources. Even after the spirit portal was closed by Wan, Air Nomads would convene with spirits through meditation. Continuing with the airy and going with the flow aesthetic, the Air Nomads firmly believed in pacifism, which is why they weren't originally involved in the war. Well, until the Fire Nation forced them to, at least. That adherence to pacifism even extended to things like revenge between Air Nomads. That reverence and respect of life and spirits carried down through the eras to Aang and the Air Nomads through their vegetarianism. Speaking on vegetarianism, its origins also come from their spiritual roots. Hey, full circle. Because of their ties to the spirit world and believing that all life is precious, it would make sense that they wouldn't want to eat animals. However, eating things like eggs or things made from animal products wasn't too out of place for them since the Air Nomads were known for making and selling some tasty pies. And we even see Aang almost eating an egg custard tart in the episode, The Great Divide. But as they were still environmentally conscious, they made sure to be as sustainable as possible and considering that the Air Nomads had the smallest population, before Sozin had the Comet Crazies, it was easier for them to focus on that ecological renewability. As it pertains to Aang at least, we see that he still respects others' decisions to eat meat with Sokka being such a big lover of meats in all shapes and sizes. It's still too bad that we never got to see Aang eat one of those sweet, sweet cabbages though. So we know about their tattoos and eating habits, but what about their homes? Well, once Wan became the Avatar, the Air Nomads became, well, Nomads. They had four air temples where they would live in between nomadic sessions though. During the last airbender, there's one in each direction, north, east, south, and west. The southern air temple was known for its winged lemurs like Momo. The northern air temple was known for hosting the Bison Polo Championship. Tenzin mentions that the eastern air temple is the most spiritual, and the western air temple is known for being the birthplace of Avatar Yang Chen, who we'll get to in just a little bit. And they're separated in twos by gender with the North and South temples having males, and the East and West having females. While not explicitly mentioned in the series, one fan theory as to why is that the nuns and monks were separated as a way for them to focus on their studies and not have any potential naughty thoughts. This doesn't mean that they couldn't travel between temples though, as we see Aang first meet Appa at the Eastern Air Temple, even though he lived at the Southern Air Temple. Each temple also had various different wildlife and would have different things like an airball arena and statues of various important people with ties to them. After the 100 year war and Aang being able to focus on more fun things, he builds a brand new temple that takes inspiration from each of the four other temples, like having flying bison and lemurs, since Aang's just a big softy for those animals. And it seems like the Air Nomads just can't catch a break, since all five of the temples have been attacked at one point. The four originals during the Fire Nation siege, and Air Temple Island was attacked by the Equalist during the battle for Republic City. Now let's talk about that tease from earlier. For those that don't know, Yang Chen was the last airbending avatar before Aang and has the legacy of being the only known airbending avatar to have a festival dedicated to her. But you might be thinking, what made her so special that she should have her own festival? Well, she was known for her peacemaking skills, brokering deals between spirits and humans, and even between the Earth Kingdom and the Fifth Nation. That coupled with a somewhat uncharacteristically aggressive way of going about those peace talks, she made for an effective and widely loved avatar. After her time being avatar was over, she became revered the world over, especially in the air and earth 
nations, which turned into an entire generation of peace following her reincarnation as Kura. The festival festivities consist of following a path that Yang Chen took on her first peace mission, eating, flying some kites, and more eating. While the festival was enjoyed by the Air Nation for generations, after the Fire Nation's destruction of the Air Nomad's culture, it was ended. But luckily, after Aang is able to establish the Air Acolytes and build back the Air Nation, Yang Chen's festival makes a return. This is also the only known holiday that the Air Nation celebrates, so it's nice that they can get back to partying. We've already talked about the way that Air Nomads govern themselves a little bit before, but let's really get into its structure. Unlike the three other nations, the Air Nomads didn't have a centralized capital and weren't governed by one royal family or government. Each of the Air Temples had their own council of elders who would dictate how each temple would be run both politically and religiously. In other words, they were an ecclesiastical senate. What a fun word that Knowledge. is. But when Aang founded the Air Acolytes, the structure was slightly changed. The four councils weren't reinstated. Instead, respected individuals took over more of a mentor role in each of the different temples. There is still no capital, and while there is no leader of the group, while Tenzin was the most senior airbending master of the time, he served as a figurehead while dealing in international affairs. Even with the governing structure, Structure to mirror the element itself, air nomad culture is very open and accepting. As nomads, as they would travel around the world, it makes sense that they would maintain support and teach being open-minded to gain some understanding on how the world works outside of the air temples. Through that and their connection with spirits and the spirit world as a whole, they believe in equality for all and that all consenting love is embraced by the community. That's evident in their love of all animal life, but also in their accepting of LGBTQ plus relationships, which meant that there wasn't any need for a coming out situation. That openness can also be seen in how Aang created the Air Acolytes, not as a group of potential airbenders, but as people who would carry on the culture of the Air Nomads. And part of that culture is something called the Anointing Ceremony. Earlier we talked about how the airbending tattoos have changed over time, but this is where we talk about what that process is and what it means. So once an airbender has passed the 36 levels of airbending, or if they're feeling creative enough to make a brand new technique like Aang with his air scooter technique, they are allowed to have the ceremony. Although we only see one of these ceremonies throughout the series, it can be assumed that they all follow the same template. During the ceremony, this is where the soon-to-be master's hair is shaved off and they get those snazzy light blue tattoos on their body. The ceremony is both a celebration of the master, but is also an event to bring the community together to welcome a new master. At the time, Aang was the youngest master by having his ceremony at 12, so it was only right that his granddaughter, Janora, beat that record by getting her tattoos at 11. But even prodigal airbenders can't do it all. Something that seems like it should be something that most, if not all, airbenders should be able to do is unaided flight. Throughout the show, we see Aang use his trusty glider for transportation and combat, but with such a mastery of the element, why can't he just fly by himself? Well, so far, there have only been two, count em, two people who have been able to fly. The first is Guru Lahima, and the second being the main villain of Book 3 of Korra, Zaheer. Which makes sense, as Zaheer was a student of Lahima's own teachings. As Lahima puts it, the only way to achieve flight is by releasing yourself from all earthly tethers. Lahima had such a mastery over flight that it was said that in his last 40 years of life, he never touched the ground. Aside from recently created techniques like the previously mentioned air scooter, there are no other known airbending moves that are as difficult to not only master, but to do it all. One reason that other powerful airbenders like the Avatar have not been able to achieve this may be due to their connection of the world, as it's their job to bring balance to it. It wouldn't really make sense for them to reject their worldly attachments when that's part of their job. Finally, let's talk about one of the most popular avatars not named Aang or Korra, Avatar Kyoshi. Aside from our titular avatars, Kyoshi is the avatar we know the most about. From various appearances in both series to her collection of novels, she proves to be one of the most interesting characters. Now, those who know the series might say that Avatar Kyoshi was an Earth Nation avatar, and that it was already mentioned that Yang Chen was the last Air Nation avatar, and both of those are true. However, Kyoshi was of both Earth and Air Nation lineage, which makes her the only known avatar to have parentage of two different nations. That mix can be seen in her personality with her stoicism reflecting the earthbending side and her sense of justice and peace relating to the airbending side. Although she was abandoned by her parents, she maintains their memory by incorporating her mother's headdress and war fans and her father's face paint. That theme of opposing ideologies wasn't just relegated to an inner battle for her either, as she was responsible for creating the Dai Li and the Kyoshi Warriors. One she regrets, and one that protects the land named after her. Kyoshi's personal struggles coupled with her struggles with being the Avatar even mirrors that of Aang's journey, and subsequently, Korra's as well. It's no wonder she's been a fan favorite for so long. For most of OG Avatar, Aang is our only look into the Air Nomads pre-Sozin getting a little 
let's say overly ambitious and dictatory. But through Aang, we see how kind, free, and generally peaceful the Air Nomads were. In Korra, we see through Tenzin's leadership position later that many, if not all of those same characteristics have been preserved as the Air Nation rebuilt itself in a new era. While it's still two generations left before a new airbending avatar, it'll be interesting to see how far the Air Nation has progressed when the time comes.